Watch this video with our virtual reality glasses for smartphone. Virtualvisor.com. The ultimate panel. Um, my name is Nan Marie Kersamali, and we can actually see the screen, which is a great thing today. Um, a little bit of my background I now instruct at Cal State Northridge, plus in uh, New Directions in Digital Media. Really starts in old directions and leads into everything from VR and AR to robotics and AI. Um, I, before that, I was uh, in fine arts. I went to an art school, actually, and I uh, worked in the industry, commercial, uh, e-entertainment, ABC, public television, and then uh, did workshops and professional development things at the American <coughs> Film Institute. So there, starting with enhanced television, interactive TV, and then uh, around the digital, media, uh, digital content lab. And actually did a K-12 screen education program as well. So we're going to be talking a lot about screens and where and how we are seeing things. So that's um, sort of why I'm in this space. And let me just get my back up. Uh, we have a great panel here. Uh, how many people, just to get guests in the room first, how many people here have used virtual reality? That's, that's actually a lot more than there was in May. How many people here have used augmented reality? Not quite as much. Um, how many people know the difference between them? Oh, good. That's good. You sure? <laughs> How many people, people think there's a difference? Yeah, right. How many think there's a difference? Oh, because of mixed reality. Right, okay. So maybe HoloLens might be a good example of that. We were talking about it earlier. Um, I'm starting to feel, after, especially after days here, that what we have going is a, a mixed up reality. Um, we're, facing, <laughs> yes. Thanks. we're facing a lot of things. You probably have heard a lot of buzzwords over the course of the week that you've been here, or even the day. Uh, about presence, empathy, and VR, the empathy machine. Uh, ever heard the term walking the plank? Talk about real. There's an application, some people have fallen off that plank. Um, in the old days, we had things, uh, and it's been talked about here in Interactive, leaning forward, uh, leaning back, rather, or sitting forward. How involved you are in something and actually acting within it. Do you relax or do you immerse yourself? Uh, we've been talking about storytelling. People suggested that maybe it's story living, story experiencing. So our production language is changing. It's changed through all these different iterations, and maybe our actual language is changing as well. Possibly cognitively we're changing. Um, our first panelist comes from many different <laughs> realities herself, many worlds within that. Um, art, film, uh, a film background actually, film studies, uh, software development. And absolutely works in the what I like to call the natural physical world, so we can make that distinction. So she makes art, deals, uh, has developed augmented reality, and she's going to concentrate a little bit on that, even though AR wasn't in the title of this panel. So I'd like to introduce Zenka. Hi, good evening. Afternoon. Uh, afternoon. Okay, so we um, will start a little bit about giving you a background of what I do. I'm a sculptor and I started uh, getting interested in these headsets and the evolution of where they've all been going. And I use um, Raku, which kind of makes futuristic stuff look like it's from the past. And I was tracing the last 50 years of the development and I got so interested in it that I started adding augmented reality to my pieces. Uh, and started to experiment with it as an art form. So I did it on the street art buildings um, using ceramics. And I was, I was in love with the magic of it and the, the, the look on people's faces when they saw 3D objects appearing. Um, I did site in, um, specific installations as well. Here's a really quick little video. So you can actually move around the three-dimensional <coughs> dragon. This is a headset-based AR piece that installs um, art on top of art. Um, this is sort of the Harry Potter effect where <laughs> you play a video and you let it run through an image. And these are sound interactive um, augmented reality pieces where the person makes a noise and the augmented reality changes based on the noises that they're making.
So uh, today I want to talk about the five biggest challenges because I feel like sometimes you can learn from other people's mistakes <laughs> almost as much as um, from looking at good, good stuff. Um, and I want to give you, you don't have to be a programmer or anything to create augmented reality. Um, you can just um, get a crew together and do it just like you would a movie. So I want to give you just a really quick sneak peek of what, of what it takes to create. Um, and then I'll go over a little bit about what's going on in AR with hardware and software. So the biggest challenge in creating this is coming up with a good idea. It should be where you put your most focus, your longest time. Um, as we know, um, AR and VR is still cumbersome. You know, people are putting on a, uh, you know, a headset, it's fogging up, it's uncomfortable or it's expensive or they have to download something. So, I mean, you look at the patients in web, 40% of people will abandon a web page if it doesn't load in three seconds. Okay, you look at 3D movies versus regular movies. I mean, who, I, I don't know, I mean, I typically just choose the regular movie over the 3D and so do a lot of people. So just putting technology, just the technology itself is not enough anymore. Um, we're moving out of demo mode into actual content. So you want to be careful about the idea. The second most important thing is coming up with a good idea. <laughs> I'm just, that's number one and number two. That's how important it is. You're going to spend a lot of pain and a lot of effort creating it. And if your idea isn't strong, um, it's, it's, it's not going to be worth the effort. So how do you know it's worth the effort? Um, one of the things is that you have to reserve time in your schedule to experiment. And that's one of the, that's the biggest mistake that people make, is they don't have time to see what works. Um, you know, and a lot of people that I've talked to at these conferences don't install the apps, they don't do VR. I mean, they said in the last panel, the best way to learn about VR is watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. And that's so important. Um, here's a little clip again of just what some people are doing with it. Creative applications of augmented reality. Of course, architects, amazing. Um, WordLens was bought by Google. You can install it on your phone for free with Google Translate. It will translate anything that you look at. IKEA catalog has been using this for a long time. People can see what their furniture looks like. They can see how the drawers open up. It's a really cool thing. Lego shows kids what's inside the box, how it moves. Patent technology is Magic Leap um, is is not out yet, um, but you can kind of see they use light fill technology. This is the desktop of the future. You know, everything's going to be voice activated. Everything's going to be with your hands and gestures. Forget about mouses. Um, you're going to learn gestures that will control. You have as many screens as you want, etc. <laughs> yeah, this is the very, very near future. I mean, you can try and close without trying them on and you'll have your body scan, you'll be able to go, and again, this is in shopping malls already today. Yeah, Try different yeah, colors. Lowe's is using a holo room where you can look oh, at your yeah, bathroom yeah. before you actually have your new bathroom made. And here's an application that sees different structures and changes the way we educate people in a deeper way. Um, something as simple as a cow or a hat that, that changes your face really fun thing. Often the most simple ideas are what is so interesting. This creating optical illusions is also really great. Here's a dragon coming out of a piece of art. Um, again, the trigger is just a piece of paper so you can move it around and have three-dimensional objects come out. Um, I'm going to skip this section um, in the interest of time. Well, I'll play a tiny clip because it's just so cool. So this is the HTC Vive, if you're not familiar with it. You can see how she's totally immersed in a fake world playing with a cute puppy. And that, you know, makes her even more immersed because she's looking and reacting to something that is um, interesting. Okay, so... Saw that green grass was standing <laughs> up on its own. <laughs> okay, no. again, number three, <clears throat> test the idea to see if it's a good idea. Here's the common pitfalls that I've seen. The experience is too long. The transition from your trigger to augmented reality isn't compelling. Um, you know, you, you might have technical difficulties of the models being too big. The sound wasn't good. Um, you know, so again, 
if you can have a prototyping software to kind of see where you're going, it's even better because you can see before you get all the programmers and the modelers together, you can see if it's working. Simplicity is stunning, illusions are good, the shorter experience and shareable things are, are really popular. The fourth challenge is getting someone to install an app on their phone or download an augmented reality app. It's hard to give them the instructions on how to do it. So that's another thing that you have to think about from the very beginning. Um, and then you have to deal with all the people that didn't install the app. Um, so that's, that's another problem. Um, you, we don't have time to actually play this, but you want to create a video of your experience so that people who didn't install the app you can tell your story on your social media, on your website, et cetera. You kind of have to tell how to do it at the beginning of them doing it. Right, the instruction right. Of, there's a learning curve that, that's incredible. Quality. Right, so uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna skip through this and move on to the next speaker. Okay. Well, when I say, I, I like to refer to it sometimes as one world and many realities. Um, and certainly that has shown us uh, one area, but uh, Larry Rosenthal has seen no the picture. evolution from... Hmm? No picture. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I, put, I thought you were going to introduce everybody from the beginning. I was, but we weren't. Maybe we should do that real quick. I wore the same we'll shirt, just so that you I'm have so to... Sorry. Inter <laughs> interface, people. We want your face there. That's part of the reason why... No, it's all about interface. I put all these together. Okay, here we go. This is Larry Rosenthal, founder, designer, director, producer. <laughs> Q3. Um, he's seen this evolution uh, from the creative world to the corporate world through many, many perspectives, many angles, um, through the interaction of interactive television, through transmedia storytelling, which was really all over digital Hollywood just five years ago. All these VR panels were about transmedia. Last time I spoke, yeah. Hmm? Last time I spoke, seven years ago. Okay, well, seven, maybe five, too. And now 3D VR. He's always looking at that next new dimension in the creation of worlds and story worlds. So take it away, Claire. Yeah, so uh, I'm Larry Rosenthal wearing the same shirt because it's everything is interface. <laughs> Before they tell you a story, it's interface when you're dealing with these kind of mediums. Uh, to fill in a little bit, yeah, I've been doing uh, this for 25 years or so. I've been, I'm a trained as an industrial designer and a narrative filmmaker at the same time, being the child of Star Wars. So I literally got one of the first color Macintoshes in New York in the late 80s, and it had a, a beta of a Swivel, which was a young Harville software for Jaron Lanier to prototype models so they could do things in VR, and when he coined the term VR. So I'm literally, I was on a panel like this in 1992 when uh, the first VR panel where uh, Doom was shown for the first time on a laptop. Nobody thought it was VR because it was on a laptop. Mistake. And everybody else had expensive HMD equipment that everybody called VR and Sega was going to save the day, mistake. And the um, lawnmower man was out and that first all took place. So uh, I've seen, you know, technology media is a wave and I've surfed many of them through uh, virtual reality. And again, 3D design being my main interest. So Thank you, first so slide up. We walk for that. Okay. So, uh, so what I'd like to talk about quickly today is I took a long, a big slideshow for an hour and took about five slides out about thoughts and ideas. But what I can look at the time today, uh, which is VR, AR, 3D story worlds are converging. We're talking about transmedia, we're talking about narrative, we're talking about story, and 3D. 3D is a media. So in 2016, we're at a place where the media attention again uh, for new products and tools that are coming out allow you to world build and design for what we call VR, AR, and 3D story worlds simultaneously. And this is that holy grail that a, that a lot of people are thinking about here from the mom and pop indie to, of course, Disney, who's really the icon of trying to do this now. Let's go next slide. So, so you know, some quick comments. Uh, you know, what is transmedia, world building, 3D story worlds, we're talking about definitions, buzzwords. We've got 30 years of that. But by now, I think most of us think about Star Wars, Marvel Universe, that means all Disney now, which it wasn't all, always, as the places, the things, the characters. The point is they all live and can be part of any medium or expression. That was the transmedia ultimate holy grail. So uh, we, again, we notice using real-time 3D media today, which literally could be that model of that dog that we saw in the video. 
You know, I mean, I have 25 years of those videos, you know, on my website and projects. So, so example, movies, games, TV, comics, VR experiences, AR and ARG is ultimate reality gaming. Pokemon is AR, ARG. Online toys, novels and books. I mean, isn't that Star Wars? Isn't that the Marvel Universe? Uh, the bottom line is Stan Lee and, and Ditko drew Spider-Man and wrote a couple of bu bubbles for him 40 years ago. Today, somebody's going to take out Alias or Maya and model something for the first time, put it up on Sketch something or other, animate it, put it into goggles, and then you have a, the birth of a VR character like Spider-Man 40 years, 50 years later. Here we go. Just some thoughts. And here, uh, the idea is to present the best idea or product experience in each media. So again, people say, what am I going to do with VR? Oh, we got a movie. My, you know, I want my cat. And VR is about character. You know, it's about Mickey Mouse. I'll just tell you quickly, 25 years ago, when there was web VR for the first time, everybody was about characters and storytelling and lots of agencies got, took SGI money and made dancing bunnies and dancing characters and none of them you know any, most of you don't know anything about it today because it's a medium, might not be the right medium. They were a perfectly good medium for cartoons called television. <laughs> TV and film, spaces and objects tell a backstory. This is world building, 5D, Alex, who I haven't met. They set the tone of the world. They target the, views, the viewer, right? An, an aged world, right? Uh, Dungeons and Dragons. You know where you are when you see knives and, versus laser guns. Games. Games really are the balance of rules targeting a player. Fairness, action, reaction is paramount. If it's not fair, it's not really going to be a good game. Uh, VR, nonlinear spacers, objects work, is an interface first. Uh, inter interface is about usage and they target the user. I'll get back to interface again. Next yeah. slide. Toys. Toys about play. Okay, is it a game? What is Lego? Is it a game? It's a toy. Sandbox. You know, the biggest house on the hill now is not owned by a film guru, it's owned by a guy who made Minecraft. No narrative. Who's the star? You answer your question. Yeah. Uh, novels. Yeah. Comics. Obviously, this is linear by nature. Obviously, the, the major IPs started as comic books or fair that are driving these companies today. Of course, the three assets can be used. You can illustrate a comic in 3D. Do it, you know, use Maya, make your characters, take those characters, move them into another media. You already have it, obviously, interactive. AR comics, if you had to see a little bit of what you were showing in your slideshow, and there are already AR comics out there. Uh, this is something I put together about a year ago, part of a presentation, almost 2015, says, so next slide. Oh, uh, pyramid. It should be an illustration. There you go. People want to define things. What's VR? I look at VR as something right now, there's a hierarchy, right? It's about immersive media projects, and they struggle with these three different elements. Which one dominates your project? will also have to describe your elevator pitch. Is it storytelling? Is it playing? Or is it experiencing? Experiencing is the walk in the woods, the 360 video in the national park. There ain't much play and there ain't much story. It's a narrative. Oh, the trees are dying. Well, I see them dying. It's a narrative, right? Uh, playing, you know. But one thing I'll mention quickly, everybody wants to talk about VR like filmmaking. Filmmaking is part of television, part of film. 70 years, 100 years of eye, ear, media. Uh, going back to the thing called Second Life, look at their logo. It's, a, it's an eye and a hand. <laughs> this is the main media of VR. Not these guys, not these guys. Don't believe me, I don't care. I'm joking, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have come out that way. Yeah, some thoughts uh, where I started in, from the last slide. Everything is interface in VR or AR. This is, comes back to the simplest thing. What am I doing? Why am I here? From the minute you slip those things on to the instructions in AR, this is about an interface. What does interface mean? Interface is not the last thing that you hire some junior designer to put some words to hang over the picture. This is, not, this is an interface, but in most computer graphics and VR, this is what people consider interface. No, interface is everything that you're going to encounter between the medium and the message and the viewer. What's the viewer? Oh, uh, uh, just I wanna, let's say here for a second. What's 3D interface communications add? I want to say immersion. More powerful than intellectual engagement. This is an emotion, not an empathy machine. Uh, first third person, I'll let that one go. The age of the user, next slide. Again, 25 years ago this term was coined, either by me or another guy who was interested in the, what was in CD-ROM, uh, Greg Roach, hyperbole. Part viewer, part user. It's a hybrid experience must be resolved. 
right? This is immersive media, interface first, laws of nature must be set and understood, gravity is there, death. How much of a fourth wall is there? Uh, again, who, what, and why? Realism versus abstraction. As an interface, function versus metaphor. Are those buildings in the distance, are they shelter or a target to be blown up? How do I know? You know? Uh, are the other characters there to meet a bond to, empathy machine? Or are they there to be cannon fodder? How do I know? It starts with the first package or the first review. Think bigger than just the thing you're doing. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. This here, which we're not going to go through completely because it would definitely get everybody crazy, uh, is I, I was invited to Story Code, which some of you may know what that is. Uh, it's kind of, again, a relic of the transmedia bubble three years ago out of New York and LA and others in Miami. And I, I figured, how can I communicate to them being the 3D guy where I'm coming from? So I actually had a slide before this, which was transmedia design codes. And what this is is kind of almost like a choose your own adventure diagram. Everything you need to know from coming up with a good idea to getting it on network TV is on the decision list here. It's the top, like what is the, you know, what 3D virtual media? Is it story, is it play, is it experience? Is the interface first, third, or God view? Sims was a God view game. Mm -hmm. uh, the style, realistic, abstract. Who are the inhabitants, the artifacts, the causality, the universe, natural law? You know, or am I making up laws? You know, because you gotta train people. You go through something like this and you check off each thing on the idea, your big idea, and you'll find yourself with a 3D transmedia creation that works across all these platforms because you've answered the right questions before you can start your project. Yeah, amazing. I'm amazing. Very well grid right there, it's very cool. I wanna move along here to Ascot. Yeah, there we go, Ascot Smith. So we're going kind of a, clearly going right into a next generation storytelling, although Larry's obviously somebody who's skipped from one generation to the next and on every level. Um, so storytelling and production, Ascot is actually pretty firmly grounded in a visual arts background, like many also went to an art school. Um, he also has a background in public art, so it's kind of interesting the whole, whole, whole interplay of public and private within this new storytelling world that we have. And um, really, I think, emphasize, and he, he's also working with um, virtual, or, or augmented or virtual reality cartooning and, uh, and definitely multi-platform multi narratives. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I've had the luxury to work on uh, multiple uh, VR and AR and ARG projects, and including uh, in-car entertainment projects, uh, working at USC's Mobile and Environmental Media Lab. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we encounter always in the beginning of any project is really like how do we onboard uh, a user into a new media. Um, so really teaching the audience the new tech while attempting to express a story. Um, so, and just to provide, you can go to the next one. So, uh, just to provide some examples, um, so it developed uh, what was called a robot talk show, which is a late night talk show which utilizes an AR app to find hidden jokes within the, within the show. Um, and then additionally, we have an interactive cartoon that is, is an interactive cartoon but a hybrid visual novel and branching narrative game uh, where you play as a detective and a telepathic cat to solve crimes again. And so my strategy for bringing people into kind of unique experiences is using humor and genre as a way to familiarize people with what they uh, can expect out of the experience. So utilizing a late night show format or utilizing a detective procedural is a way to at least uh, set up some anticipation for what they're going to get out of the experience. And additionally, um, I found that when as soon as someone like laughs at something that occurs within the story, like the technology essentially vanishes. That they just kind of go further in and they want to participate further. Um, and using humor, I think, is like a really strong tool to uh, basically disengage someone who is, uh, you know, just learning a new media. Um, I guess we can continue to this. Sort of a vanishing point. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Do you want to keep going or? Um, yeah, sure, I can keep going. Um, no, I, didn't. <laughs> I didn't ask if you wanted to keep going. Do you want me to go to the next slide or stay on? Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> you have no choice here. I know, I'm on the panel. The machine right. is part of it. So, um, 
So I just want to present an example of a, a project that um, is kind of moving from animated television into virtual reality. If you want to go ahead and go to the next yes. slide. Okay. So if, I don't know, if you guys are familiar with the show Rick and Morty, uh, which is a really sarcastic, postmodern, uh, kind of late night comedy show. Well, one of the co-creators uh, created uh, Squanch Tindo, which should kind of already tell you like the kind of content that they're <laughs> making. Um, and, and essentially, you know, they're, they're not trying to replicate the storytelling that comes out of television in VR. They're just trying to take the <coughs> kinds of experiences, the kinds of humor, and apply it within that format. So if you want to go ahead and go to the next. Sure. And so these are just some screenshots. Unfortunately, the trailer is not safe for work. Um, but they're, they're, they just released it this week. Accounting, you play as a, an accountant at a virtual reality firm uh, that's doing really well, and they want you to continue uh, doing your job as an accountant, which means uh, going into virtual reality um, and playing through levels. Um, and at each level, you basically have to find the next virtual reality headset to go kind of deeper, kind of a Inception-esque. I mean, what could be more fun than playing, to pretending to be an accountant? Yeah, so it's, it's a dark, it's, it's sarcastic and humorous, and I, I really feel like the, the, the humor uh, kind of helps translate the experience mm -hmm. and moves, it makes you kind of revel in the limitations that, uh, that kind of early VR games uh, might be kind of grappling with. I just want to interject really quickly. 20 some odd years ago, Dilbert VR was one of the major big projects being funded to be this kind of thing, and, but it had to be Dilbert sitting there on his typewriter, character based, I, I won't give an name of who did it all again, but it shows you that in 20 years, the vision thing, how now they're doing this with it, because this, this, this is what they should have did yeah. 20 years ago, this is, what I, this is what I got thrown out of the room for suggesting yeah. to, you know, was you are Dilbert. You don't watch Dilbert. This yeah. is what I was saying about, and it's. I, mean, yeah, exactly. I, I know these, you know, what they're doing. This is amazing to see this. Slide. Yeah, no, it's great. Cool. I'm glad it, you is there ask? Yeah. Is there act, an actual um, any kind of educational component to this, or is it pure fun? Uh, I would say it's completely pure fun. Yeah, you're essentially getting yelled at uh, at your job to perform these tasks, uh, and it's sort of like you know. I'm trying to think of a way to express it. But basically, it, it's, it's kind of making fun of you for not knowing how VR works, which I think all, right. a lot of people who are going into this are, are like, duh. But it, in a way, this is, it's funny because of the experience. I, I can understand that there might be people who might not appreciate that sense of humor. But I but so no, there aren't. It, it happens. Uh, they might not want to get yelled at by funny British sounding people. But the, personally, I want someone to pay me to get yelled at. That was the Monty Python, right? right. Exactly. Which was the best thing to see you wrong. But, but I, I I think it just really expresses the kind of formal qualities of VR within the kind of game space that's currently being developed in a, in a really kind of postmodern and hilarious way. Right. Um, well, it really illustrates that putting yourself in someone else's shoes aspect of VR. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I guess I just have one more point. Um, so my background is as a filmmaker, um, but also as a game designer. And I think like one of the biggest challenges that uh, I've encountered is really recognizing that the story cannot be the hierarchy as you're designing any interactive work. Um, and it's really, uh, the hierarchy is often shared with the game design and the story, and they both need to kind of essentially like reflect what the interactive experience is going to be. So often you might have like a great story, but with bad gameplay or kind of lacking interactions, but no one's ever going to get to that. Um, because people are just not going to be engaged. Like they're not going to be able. They're not going to experience the great pros that you've come up with if your if your interactions have not been thought through. Um, and the same is kind of said too. Is like you know you need the visual metaphor. You need the kind of narrative metaphors um, to facilitate the gameplay as well. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting when we get past game play. Because, you know, again, definitions of things. I mean, because games became the predominant media of interaction of, of, you know, and 
maybe that's going to be an interesting thing to see in like a digital Hollywood show where people again from a narrative world are trying to define what they're trying to do. Or like I say sandboxes are play, not games. Game, sure. Games are again rules, and but again that's just been the popular predominant you know thing that looks like a you know 3D cartoon media. Quake on, is game, right? But yeah. VR will make it so much more. Did uh, that's what we were. Want to no, I, I no, I'm, I'm okay. Um, <laughs> right, the, uh, I think we can move on. I think okay. I've, I've, I've spent my time. No. <laughs> yeah, check it out if people haven't seen it. It's beautiful. There is actually a pretty incredible augmented reality sandbox, speaking of sand play, that's um, literally they move the sand around and there's uh, augmented reality images that change with the shifting sand. Um, is that a location-based piece, or...? It's a projected, projected. It's a projected thing, yeah. so it's projecting it's augmented good. reality, so when you change the sand, it's projecting different images on the top based on the topography, how the water's falling, ah. like all that. It's a very, right. so the, very the, cool. Okay, so it's even yeah. virtual sand. It's real sand, yeah. It's, it's, real, it's real sand. Projected on top. Projected on, on <laughs> totally <project>. mixing, yeah, <laughs> totally mixing reality. Yeah. Exactly. And you don't need a headset, which is great, because when you use AR projection, right. you you eliminate this whole problem of having someone have to install. Well, that's been the problem with VR, is having lines of people waiting. Yeah. And yeah. it's, how do you do? How do you show VR yeah. to forty people? But you need the VR arcades for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm waiting to have tilt brush without a headset myself. Um, I want to move along now. I read Shane Pace, who's uh, Dr. Shane Pace. He was my <laughs> was actually my instructor. I'm working on a master's degree in media psychology at Fielding Graduate Institute, and Shane was my instructor in uh, immersive media and social change. So now we're talking about the ways that the language is changing, production uh, forms of production are changing, <coughs> the story world is changing. A lot of it, we're seeing a lot of the same thoughts throughout that in terms of our adherence to real story, good story content, to characters, uh, point of view and audience. What's happening in our world actually? There are there actual cognitive changes that are happening while we're using this equipment? Um, are there ways that people are engaging and remembering their own stories differently by these experiences? Um, I'm going to let Shane uh, address that and more and tell us a little bit more about his background. Okay, so yeah, if you want to do tilt brush, you can, uh, without the headset, there's a red pill. There's a what? A red pill. A red pill. <laughs> the colors. And Google has the blue pill. Yeah, and Google has the blue Facebook's the red pill, Google the there you go. Yeah. I think that's what the candidates both took before the last debate. <laughs> so hi everybody, I'm Dr. Shane Pace, I'm a media <laughs> technology psychologist. Um, I'm a founding consulting partner at Reality Science. I'm now the director of client relations there. Uh, it's a think tank and a consulting firm. We help uh, media technology firms of all sizes uh, improve content, measure experiences, and understand the psychology of human engagement with their media. Uh, I'm also the director of uh, technology at the Lot Project. We create um, augmented reality uh, applications and experiences that tell stories uh, and that have a lasting social impact. Um, so what's a scientist doing on a panel about the aesthetics and language in VR? Um, I am an AR and VR junkie. I love the space. Um, but I'm here to talk about the problems that exist when we talk about the language. Um, when we go back to traditional media, we know the language, right? It's there. It's in stone. Um, there are many, 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 many experts for almost 100 years in the language of traditional media. And you don't even have to be an expert. You can look to those experts and figure out how to do traditional media. But when it comes to AR and VR, there's really not a language, in, in, in my argument, that we have that's set in stone. There are pieces of it that we're starting to put in place now. But we really don't have that language yet. Um, how many of your content creators? That's quite a few of you. So, I assume, like all of us in content creation, in one form or another, you find it challenging to make quality, quality content. How do we make this stuff? Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about that today. First and foremost, though, um, one of the things that um, I've seen here at Digital Hollywood, and just about every other uh, uh, VR, AR, mixed reality, new technology media um, uh, panels and presentations I go to, is the terms that we use are being very loosely thrown around. How many people have heard everything here at Digital Hollywood being called VR? Every <laughs> single panel. Just whether it's content creators, same. whether it's executives at studios, whether it's coders and developers, everything is VR. Stop it. It is not. <laughs> VR is VR. VR is very specific. Right? 
True VR is an experience where you are in, embedded into a virtual world where you are the actor, you are the character, you move around that environment, you interact with that environment, you create the story, you create the narrative, and you have an impact on that story. 360 video is 360 video, it is not VR. Why is that important? But it's not a big deal, we can call it whatever we want. No, you can't, because when you start mixing those terms, and you start throwing them around loosely, the language that we're desperately needing to create the great content goes out the window. So if we're creating content for a studio because some executive somewhere says, oh, call that guy, he knows how to do VR. And they call you up and they say, here's a million bucks, go make me VR for this children's program. They're like, okay. And you get all the details you think you need and you go and you create it and then you turn around and you deliver it to them. They go, what the hell is that? We don't have one of those headset thingies, and how are we going to do this? No, we just wanted a thing on the phone that you could do like this. As lame as that story sounds, it happened to somebody I know. And it was a big studio that does kids' productions, and we won't go any deeper than that. But that's what they wanted. They wanted a simple thing that they held their phone up and did, you know, landscape VR. But they didn't like what they got, which was made for Oculus and Rift, or uh, the Rift and the F5. So, Using that language, it's really, really important that we use the correct terms. Because when you don't use the correct terms, it takes away from the power of the other. 360 video, I don't personally dig it, but it's got some great spaces. And there are some good things that are being done in it. But if you call that VR, that takes away from what VR is. And if you call VR 360, you're taking away the power of what VR is. So you need to use those terms, and we need to establish those terms as an industry and use them as a standard. Um, I was talking with my uh, colleague, the uh, soon-to-be Dr. Tanisha Singleton, a uh, brilliant mind and one of our partners in cons uh, the consulting firm, Reality Science. Um, and she was talking about the amount of times this week she heard the term experience thrown around. Um, and how shocking it was that every single person seemed to have a different understanding of what the word experience meant. Well, experience has a very, very fine definition. We can look it up. But everybody uses it in a different way. Again, it's just doing service. As a media psychologist, it drives me crazy because as a scientist, everything is set in stone, right? So we're very rigid thinkers. It's this, it's this, and this. When you start adding variables, it changes things. But when I hear things like immersion and presence and perception being thrown around in various ways, it drives me nuts because everybody means it in a different way. But for me as a scientist, they have to mean the same thing. And so as content creators, if you really, really, really want to make an impact, if you really want to do a great job, first, use the terms properly. Know what perception is. Know what immersion is. Know what presence is. Some of those things we can measure, some of them we can't, some of them we're learning how to measure. But learn what those terms exactly mean. Because if you can do that, then you can sell the crap out of what you're doing to studio executives. Because you can walk in and they say, oh yeah, we know about that presence thing. And you go, no, you don't. Well, you I don't. don't. You don't. <laughs> and when you do tell them what it actually is, then they get very excited about it. Mm, um, sure. So I think when you're talking about experience, you, you've got to listen to Jimmy and uh, roll over. Rover and let Jimmy take over. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, for me, as a media psychologist and as a content creator, it is truly all about the story. And Larry and I were having a conversation outside, and he brought up a really good point. When we talk about some of these newer technologies, it's really not about story anymore. It's about narrative. Because that narrative can be interactive and can change as we start to engage with that technology. Um, it's so about depth. We, it's about depth. Yes. Uh, layers of a, you know the the story of something uh, you know Shakespeare story has to, you know there's depth to each character that's why you know Romeo and Juliet as a story you know iconic right you know but the narrative is quite simple boy meets girl boy meets yeah. girl boy you know and Star Wars these are narratives and we learn and frankly all you know all our movies are just narratives today because they came from 16 page comic books <laughs> so are we thinking of story as having a traditional way of being very linear beginning middle end as opposed to the narratives well so, the, yeah the I was also going to say it's also what he was saying about it's it's just as much about the user experience and the interface as it is the story. Right. Because I've, I've done augmented reality t-shirts where stuff's coming out, whatever, and I tried to tell a story that was too long and people were like, oh, this is too long. Like, they wanted to see the illusion of something coming out. They wanted the, the physical, that user experience more than the story. So you have to realize that story could be secondary or, or at least, you know, as he mentioned, on par with the actual experience. I mean, so we're trying to create artifacts and, if, you know, we're, this is an industry 
return on the conference too. I mean, yeah. see, industry wants product. Absolutely. We're looking they at artifact. Product. Product, product, they don't care how they get it or what it is, and they only want it when the other guy has it. Right. And uh, so, you know, it's, I mean, 20 years ago this summer, I came here and put out a thing of all this through AOL, and they just, you know, when they couldn't figure out what to do with it yet, I went to Sony, uh, you know, who, and it was like, the first question I said when I had this, you know, massively multiplayer online science fiction world where you're the star, in other words, Halo or anything like this in 1996, who's attached to it and what's, who's the star, who's attached to it, and who's the main character? And when I said you, they didn't know what I was talking about. It was a complete disconnect, you know, between me and everybody else in the room because I said it's not, it's Brad Pitt, I mean, it, it, you know, it's Leonardo playing the guy who dies on the boat. And I said, well, no, you are dying on the, you're going to die on the boat at the end. <laughs> I mean. I think I, we've got two sides of the same coin a bit, a little bit of. But that was a taxonomy issue chimera. in an industry. Yeah. You know, and that's what I, I, I agree about taxonomy. You know, but they, they, you know, and I, I, my only point would be, that's for an, in, an industry who creates that when there is an industry, and I don't, there's no industry in VR. No, yeah, and, but, and that's just it. It's, it's chaos yeah. theory out here. It's the Wild West. It's been this, and that's what technology drives creatives and artifacts. Yeah. In my opinion, 30 years of it. Yeah. And, well, and we're reaching and only that once in a while point. breaks out. Games and entertainment broke out, as we said, outside. I mean, it took, it took 15 years to that one weekend when the top game outgrows the top movie that this conference changed. Yeah, absolutely. But we've seen throughout all of these different technological advances that Yes, if you have a good story, but the means of presenting it, the gameplay or whatever is fails at it, right. you lose the value of that good story. Likewise, if you've got all the gadgets going, it's nothing but a tinker toy, it doesn't go any further right tool, right in a job. real story. What I want to know here, and um, I think actually ask that we talked about this before, was how is this changing? A lot of what's happening with virtual reality is that we're still working from the outside looking in in terms of the tools as creators. What happens now, the tools are changing so that you can actually build this story world, this environment from within the application. You want to start first, ask God, and then? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that one of the biggest challenges, uh, at least anybody who's just like starting out and trying to make their own VR or AR content is that you're just guessing. Uh, and you're doing a lot of like just trial and error. You're positioning things, and then you're going to put your headset on. And that back and forth is just like very time consuming. Uh, so there are new tools that are coming out which allow you to actually build, uh, you know, 3D environments, uh, lighting effects, all, all sorts of things, like while you're wearing the device. And I believe that... Uh, <laughs> 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 